Welcome to section 3.2. Okay, so we'll actually define matrix multiplication. We've already used the definition. You're well familiar with the definition from your sophomore linear algebra experiences. Uh, section 3.2 is uh, multiplication of matrices and multiplication of vectors and matrices. Uh, we'll encounter a little bit of stuff I doubt you've seen before. What the plan is, uh, formally defined, again, product of matrices, elementary matrices, and see how these interact with uh, the trace operator and the determinant operator, functional, I guess they are. They give us out numbers, recall. <clears throat> we'll also uh, introduce an inner product of matrices, uh, so there's something certainly new. But these other topics you've likely seen before from linear algebra. Okay, so take matrix A to B. The, the usual with the entries, lowercase a sub i j, let this be an m by n matrix, and let B with the usual entries be an n by s matrix, the usual condition, the second dimension of the A matrix is the same as the first dimension of the B matrix. So in other words, the number of columns of A equals the number of rows of B because you know what we're gonna do. We're gonna do that row times column thing. The number of columns of A is the number of entries in the rows of A. And over here, the number of rows of B or the number of entries uh, in the columns of matrix B. So when we do the row of A dot product, inner product, um, column of B type thing, the row times column stuff that you do in matrix multiplication, of course we have to have those dimensions be the same. We'll define the matrix product, also known as the Cayley product. I, th I think we'll probably never use that terminology except at the very end of this section when we observe uh, that there's a historical reason for this being called a Cayley product. But the matrix product of these two matrices, denoted A times B, call it matrix C, uh, is the M by S matrix C with entries C sub I J, where C sub I J is a sum from one to N, A sub I K, B sub K J. So we're summing over the second index on the A's, and the first index on the B's, and that's what gives you that row times column behavior of matrix products. Uh, when the dimensions of A and B are suitable so that A and B, uh, AB is defined, that is when the second dimension of A equals the first dimension of B, A and B are said to be conformable for multiplication. Some properties, uh, probably all of these are familiar to you. Uh, properties for matrix multiplication are as follows. I'm going to abbreviate the statement of these. Uh, when we take the transpose of a product, we get the product of the transposes in the opposite order. Uh, matrix multiplication is associative. Matrix multiplication distributes over matrix addition. That is A times B plus C is AB plus AC. We don't have commutivity, so we've got to reverse things. If we want to talk about distribution with the um, matrix addition on uh, the left instead of the right, and say B plus C times A is BA plus CA. Assuming you know all these matrix products exist, that is that the matrix matrices are conformable uh, for the multiplication. Uh, and fourthly, this one might be new to you, uh, if A and B are diagonal matrices, okay, so we are restricting them to be square matrices here. If A and B are diagonal matrices, then AB is a diagonal matrix. We only define diagonal, uh, I think, for square matrices. When we talked about the principal diagonal, even when we didn't have square matrices, but the term diagonal, as I recall, was restricted to square matrices. But a product of diagonal matrices is diagonal. If A and B are both upper triangular, then the product A times B is upper triangular. If A and B are both lower triangular, then the product is lower triangular. So let's take a look at the proof of the first three of these. With a background we've got, oh, this won't take too long. Okay. All right, first let's prove A, B transpose is B transpose, A transpose. 
All right, uh, as I'm prone to do, let's introduce a new matrix, call it matrix C, and matrix C, let's define to be AB transpose. Let its entries be C sub IJ. All right, so I want to find um, the entries of this matrix C and see if they're the same as the entries of the matrix B transpose, A transpose. So that's how we'll establish the equality. Uh, first, the ijth entry of AB, by definition, is exactly this, summing over K, A sub I K, B sub K J, that's our definition of matrix product. So, if we look at C sub I J, the entries of the transpose of that matrix, we'll just swap the I's and the J's. So, C sub I J would be what we get by swapping the I's and J's here, so that would give us a sum, K equals 1 to N, summing over second index of A, first index of B, A sub J, K, B sub K, I. So we swap the roles of I and J from up here because we're transposing matrix A, B to consider matrix A, B transpose, and that's what matrix C is. Okay, uh, for B transpose, we need to look at this other side of the equation now, B transpose, A transpose. For B transpose, let the entries be uh, of, uh, <clears throat> let the entries of matrix B be B sub I J. So if we want to transpose that, we'll get B sub J I's. Um, I see this more cleanly if I let the entries of matrix B be represented by a B sub I J super T. So the I J entry of B transpose is B sub I J super T. And let's do a similar thing for matrix A. So A transpose has the entries A sub I J super T. I find it easier when I go through uh, and take matrix products if I introduce these super T's. So when we take a product, we'll do the same kind of thing we have straight from the definition. So the IJ entry of B transpose A transpose, okay, that's uh, the, the right-hand side of this equation. It better turn out to be the same thing we had up here. The IJ entry would be uh, by our definition, we'll take the IK entry of the first matrix and the KJ entry of the second one. That would be B sub IK transpose and A sub KJ trans, uh, super T, I should read this as, because these are just numbers. So B sub IK super T and A sub KJ uh, super T. Same thing we have from the definition, only we got the superscripts of T's and we got the B's first and the A's second. Yeah, because the B matrix comes first and the A matrix comes second. Well, transposes. All right, so we'll get this kind of uh, summation for the IJ entry of that. Now let's switch back straight from the super T things to the en entries, the elements of um, A and B themselves. Uh, B sub I K super T, B sub I K super T would be regular B with the indices interchanged. So I'll replace this with a regular B sub uh, K I, reverse the indices. Similarly for A, we'll get A sub J K from this A sub K J super T. So we've effectively swapped the entries. If you can see that directly, uh, and write out this matrix product immediately in terms of the A subs and the B subs. Uh, good for you, I like to slow it down and see the details. Uh, this, we can just simply reverse the order here. Write this as A sub J K times B sub K I. And that's exactly what we had up here for the C sub I J's. So we've got the I J entry of um, AB transpose is the same as the IJ entry of B transpose, A transpose. That is, those two matrices are equal. Okay, uh, standard proof for establishing equalities of matrices. I show their entries are the same. Uh, let's do that kind of thing again this time. <clears throat> Uh, we're trying to show associativity of multiplication. All right, so we want to show A times BC equals AB times C. Okay, so we'll have to do this by finding entries. We had a product here involving three matrices, so this will, no surprise, involve a double sum. Each product introduces a sum. So the IJ entry of B times C would be the sum 
B sub IK, C sub KJ, matrix B times matrix C, IJ entry, usual thing, summing over K. Just keep an eye on the dimensions here. K ranges from one to S uh, in this B times C. This S is the second dimension of the B and the first dimension of the C. So that's what gets summed over. Um, so we sum up to S. All right, uh, now let's look for the KJ entry. That's what we're gonna need downstairs of matrix B times C, okay. Um, requires me to do some fiddling around with the, with the indices. Uh, first, we were summing from K equals one to S. I wanna talk K over here. Let's rewrite that in terms of the parameter L. So we'd have a sum from L equals one to S we'd have B sub I L, C sub L, J. Next, this was the I, J entry. I wanna replace the I here with a K down here. So this B sub I, K, when all the dust settles, becomes a B sub K, L. The C sub K, J, becomes a C sub L, J. We were talking about the I, J entry of B, C, and the K, J entry. So J plays the same role. K is replaced I, and we need to replace the K here with an L. <clears throat> All right, so there's the uh, K, J entry of the matrix product B, C. All right, so if we wanna find the I, J entry of A times B, C, we get the following. We'll take the I, K entry of A, and we'll take, we need the KJ entry of the matrix B times C. Well, the KJ entry of matrix B times C is this thing here. So that's what goes there. So we've got A sub IK times a um, sub KJ entry of the second matrix. We've got the KJ entry of the second matrix here. Okay, now some distribution and some movement around us on some summations and we'll produce the answer. Uh, we can take the sums totally outside if you like we're distributing the IK throughout this inner sum. We can reverse the order of summations. And we get a sum from L, <coughs> L equals one to S, sum from K equals one to N of this product, A sub IK, B sub KL, C sub LJ. So we get the product of those inside. I wanna sum the C sub LJs out, I can do that. Um, this involves K, so I can bring the C sub LJ outside of that summation if you like. All right, so now I'm looking for some things that look familiar. Uh, far right, we've got a C sub LJ, okay, and we're summing over that L. I'm gonna fiddle around with the indices a little bit. Um, let me see, we get from here to here by interchanging the dummy variables. Interchanging the dummy variables. Interchange L and K. I went to great trouble to introduce these indices to make it look like the definitions. So we're, inter we're interchanging these. Okay, so we'll have a sum from K equals 1 to S, right? A sum from L equals 1 to N, right? Uh, the Ks in here will become Ls. So we should have L's here and here, L's here and here, and the L here and here should become a K. The L on the outside of the B and the inside of the C, as it were, become K's. Right, so we've interchanged uh, dummy variables over which we're summing. Now, this looks like the IK entry of the product AB. The IK entry of product AB, uh, yeah, we usually speak of the IJ entry, uh, but here we've got the IK entry because we've got an I here and a K here, and we're summing over this dummy variable L. Indeed, this is the IK entry of AB. That IK entry of matrix A times B is multiplied by the KJ entry of matrix C. Dude, that's uh, uh, then the I, J, entry of A, B times C. So we've got the I, J, entry of A, B times C written in this form. We started with the I, J, entry of A times B times C. So the I, J, entry of A, B, C is the same as the I, J, entry of A, B 
times C, and there's your associativity. So it actually happens pretty fast. Um, I'd say the tricky part with most of this matrix manipulation stuff is all those, um, the indices and the dummy variables and making it look like something you recognize. Okay, so this establishes associ associativity of matrix multiplication. Uh, I think we're probably pretty close to having us a group um, under matrix multiplication of, of something or other. Um, we've got a binary operation, matrix multiplication. It's associative, uh, it's not commutative, it must be close to having a non-abelian group. Um, we need an identity, and of course there's an identity matrix under some restrictions. We would have to restrict ourselves to um, uh, square matrices to talk an identity, and we need to make sure we had inverses. But anyhow, this is very suggestive that we can make a group out of matrices using the binary operation of matrix multiplication. You can if you make sufficient restraints, constraints, um, to ensure an, the existence of an identity and inverses. Uh, distribution, uh, this is more of a sort of a, almost a field type property here. Uh, take A, B, and C to be of the appropriate sizes so that the following matrix multiplication satisfied. We want to show we can distribute A times B plus C equals AB plus AC. All right, this should be a little bit easier than that previous one. Uh, it involves um, two matrix products, but it doesn't involve any products of three matrices all at once. Uh, if we can prove that, I'm sure it's similar to have the matrix multiplied on the right instead of the left. So let's, uh, let's consider A times B plus C. Okay, how would you deal with A times B plus C? I'd find the IJ entry of that by taking the IK entry of A and the KJ entry of B plus C. Well, matrix addition, piece of cake, it's done entry wise. So the KJ entry of B plus C is B sub KJ plus C sub KJ. So when we take this matrix product, we get for the IJ entry, a sub IK, the sub KJ element of matrix B plus C, which is given here. We can distribute, just distribution of real numbers. And look at this, we got a sum A sub IK, B sub KJ. That's the IJ entry of matrix A times matrix B. Same similar thing over here. We've got the um, IJ entry of matrix A times matrix C over here. So the IJ entry of A times B plus C is the IJ entry of AB plus the IJ entry of AC. So we've got uh, A times B plus C, it's a bit of a typo there, is uh, AB plus AC, excuse me for the boo boo. We've established this uh, yields AB plus AC upon distributing. Uh, the fourth one of these, the stuff about diagonal um, products of Diagonal matrices are diagonal and similar for upper and lower triangulars, left as an exercise. Okay, so these aren't quite as tedious as some of the stuff we did in the previous section. Uh, we've already used this fact, but it's formally defined at this stage in the book. Uh, the n by n matrix, which is diagonal with all entries of one, it's called the identity matrix of order n denoted either with just an I, or I'll give gentle this, usually denotes it with an I sub N. That's a better notation, because there's a bunch of identity matrices uh, that need to know some dimensions in terms of uh, what specifically to use when multiplying non-square matrices. Uh, if we take an N by M matrix A, if you multiply it on the left by I sub N, on the left, let's see, be n by n. We're going to multiply it by an n by m matrix. That'll work on the left. It won't work on the right. Then you get matrix A back. If you multiply on the right by the m by m identity matrix, then you'll get matrix A back. Does that product make sense? We take an n by m and multiply it by an m by m. Yeah, in this case, that second dimension of A would equal the first dimension of I sub n, and the product exists there as well. So you've got these identity matrices that might take on a little more general role for you than they did um, in linear algebra. You probably kept this conversation to a square matrix A when you had this kind of 
uh, multiplication. But for non-square matrices, we still get this identity type behavior. Hmm, so we can um, add matrices together. We can multiply matrices together and we can multiply matrices by scalars. So we can take linear combinations of matrices. That doesn't use any of the matrix product stuff. Here's something possibly you touched on in linear algebra is taking a polynomial and putting a matrix in it. And it makes sense because you can raise a matrix to powers, you can multiply it by scalars and can then add that stuff together. So if we take P, or P of X if you like, as a polynomial, sum from K equals zero to N, B sub K, X to the K, regular real number polynomial, we could put that matrix in there and define the polynomial evaluated at that matrix A to be, let's see, uh, we'd want a constant term here. Uh, of course, I can add a constant to a matrix, kind of thinking, this is sort of like X to the zero power. It's a little bit of a problem with that interpretation. When X equals zero, we got some problems. But usually when we plug in K equals zero, we think of that as giving us, this is shorthand really, it gives us the constant term B sub zero. We can't add constant to matrices, but we can take that constant and multiply it by the identity matrix, which I might think of in some sense as A to the zero power. Uh, but we can define this P of A in this sense. So we get the constant term times the identity matrix of B sub one times matrix A, B sub two times matrix A squared, up to B sub N times matrix A to the nth power. So we can uh, actually put matrices in polynomials. We won't do a lot of it, but we'll do a tiny bit of it somewhere down the road. Uh, when we encounter um, characteristic polynomials, we'll put matrices in characteristic polynomials at some point. Something you probably didn't, probably didn't do in linear algebra. Um, you know, if we dealt with systems of linear equations with constant coefficients, systems of, sorry, linear differential equations, with constant coefficients, um, you can take their first order, you can take a, such a first order system of equations, actually write it as a matrix of coefficients, it's these constant coefficients that's mentioned here, times x as a function of some parameter, call it t. So we can take a system of first order linear differential equations with constant coefficients, and express it in terms of a, a matrix and vector equation. X prime equals A, X of T. Um, if these were just straight up functions and we had something of the form Y prime equals A Y, and A was a constant, then you'd say that's, that's exponential functions. Yeah, you know what? It's exponential functions, even when you have this stuff in terms of um, vectors and matrices as well. You can solve these such systems of equations using exponentiation of a matrix. I bring this up, uh, see uh, probably a senior level applied math class uh, that might cover this, a second differential equations class would cover this kind of stuff. Um, does it make sense to exponenti exponentiate a matrix? Well, it makes sense to put it in a polynomial and you've got a power series for the exponential function. So we could take that matrix and put it in the power series. Uh, though, as soon as I bring a power series, any kind of series, I worry about, uh, worry about convergence and divergence. So there's definitely some details to be processed here. But just as it makes sense to put a matrix in a polynomial, it makes sense to put um, a matrix in an exponential function as well. Uh, and it involves uh, some applications with eigenvalues, it turns out. Um, this can be done by uh, diagonalizing the matrix, uh, simply raising a matrix to power, you know, from linear algebra, you diagonalize it and do some things with eigenvalues um, that allows you to compute powers of a matrix more easily. And there's some constraints on those eigenvalues when you do that. Uh, but these matrices can be diagonalized and it makes sense from power series actually to exponentiate certain matrices. So there's an application of this stuff you might run across somewhere out there. Uh, it'll be a while, I guess, before we look at diagonalized 
diagonalization of matrices. Um, we won't talk differential equations because we got enough stuff on our plate, but in a DE's class, probably a second DE's class, you might see some of these applications. We're infatuated with matrices. So consider a matrix that's partitioned A, B, C, D, and a second matrix partitioned as E, F, G, H, where the dimensions, we'll look at this in a little more detail here shortly, but the dimensions of the A's, B, C, and D are such that usual thing, there's no gaps between these. So these, these mesh together well. We'll look at the dimension of this particular matrix as well as this one um, shortly. Uh, and the dimensions are such that I can take the A matrix and multiply it by the E matrix. I can take the B matrix, multiply it by the G matrix, and I can do some stuff with the C's and D's versus all these matrices. And what we're doing is expressing a product of partitioned matrices as a partitioned matrix. And the claim E is, if I look at this the right way, it won't be terribly surprising. If we take the product of these two given matrices where the dimensions are such that there's no gaps in the partition and the following multiplication is conformable, then that's what all this stuff is with a K's and M's and L's and Q's and P's and all that stuff. Uh, then that matrix product produces a partition matrix itself of this form. Now this doesn't look too surprising if you think I would do row times column. If I did row times column in a matrix product, we'd have A times Z plus B times G. A times Z plus B times G in that, uh, that entry there. But these aren't numbers, these are matrices but there's how you can remember it. Uh, second row, first column. Second row, first column will give us CE plus DG. CE plus DG. So this isn't a surprising result when you look at it like that. It's also easy to remember when you look at it like that. So let's go through and establish that this matrix product actually gives this. Tell you what we're gonna do. We're gonna establish it for this uh, stuff up here and the other stuff will follow similarly. So let's look at that. So here's the statement again. We're given a whole bunch of dimensions. Like I said, oh, let's make it big. We'll write this out um, in terms of labeling some of those dimensions. We were given dimensions that will lead us to a situation where this matrix is K plus N by L plus M. All right, this would be the number of rows. That's because the number of rows in A or K. We've got K rows in A and N rows in C. N is C by something. K is, um, A is K by something. So that's where the K plus N comes from. But in terms of the columns, it was set up such that A has L columns and B has M columns. So we've got L plus M, L plus M columns across the top. And you can kind of reverse engineer what the dimensions are from this. So then uh, A must be K by L. C must be N by L. Uh, D must be N by M. And so forth over here. All right. So notice we've got common dimensions in some of this stuff. There's, there's two L's, um, uh, two M's. Um, we're going to ultimately multiply. Let's see. We're going to multiply A by E. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, the second dimension of A was a, was an L. The first dimension of E is L. Yeah, that matrix product exists. These um, outer parameters end up playing roles uh, over here when we look at um, certain dimensions. So when you take the products, the, the K's and the L's and the M's, ensure conform, conformability. <clears throat> Let's check the arithmetic. All right, like I said, we're just gonna check it for this little piece up here. Uh, it's a, just a matter of taking the definition of this matrix times this matrix, and then finding the entries of the little sub matrices in the appropriate place. Okay, so let M be this first matrix and let N be the second matrix. Let their entries be M sub IJ and N sub IJ. Then the IJ entry of M times N, 
would simply be a sum from say r equals one to uh, the appropriate size, L plus M, M sub I R, N sub R, J. IJ entry should look something like that. The dummy variable we have is not a K, it's an R. All right, so there's the IJ entry of M N. We wanna show that the IJ entry of M times N is this stuff here for the appropriate values of i and j. For different values of i and j, it's this. For other values of i and j, it's this or that. So we're just checking i's and j's. It's the easy one, actually, the, the first ones. We're checking for this. Okay, if i is between one and k, i is between one and k, all right, that would mean um, we're taking things from the first through the kth row so we're taking entries across here. So we're getting first entries of A and then entries of B. But wait, let's take J to be between one and P. Uh, if J is between one and P, let's see over here, then we were dealing with uh, the second dimension, P, tells you how many columns you've got across here. There's two columns over these. So when we do um, I is one through K, J is one through P, we're doing stuff here times stuff here. We're doing AB stuff times EG stuff. That's what it amounts to with that restriction. You wanna take um, AB stuff times FH stuff, okay? You'll keep the I's the same and you'll change the J's. They would run from, uh, mm, they'd pick up, do you believe, at Q plus one? Sorry, they would pick up at P plus one. We left off first column, second column, up through P column. Jump over to here to get P plus first column, P plus second column, up to P plus Q column. So if we wanted to do ABs times FHs, we'd change the range of the Js. We'd pick up at P plus one and go through P plus Q. There's the P plus Q there. So that's how you deal with the uh, other cases of this. And there's only four of them because we've partitioned into two by two. Uh, then we'll have, we're going to make a little substitution in here. We'd have the sum from uh, R equals one to L plus M, M sub I R, N sub R J. Remember that's the I J entry of the matrix product. We could break that into a sum from L, uh, R equals one to L and then R equals L plus one to L plus M. We just wrote the sum as two sums, nothing to that. Just broke up the sum into two sums. And we did it that way because, let's see, um, when I is between one and K, when I is between one and K, we're getting um, either entries from matrix A, entries from matrix A, or entries from matrix B entries from matrix B. Uh, when J is between one and P, we're getting first entries from matrix E and then entries from matrix G. First entries from matrix E, second entries from matrix G. And we've used the usual lowercase notation on these matrices um, uh, in the statement of the statement of the theorem or the previous page. The usual notation with the lowercase letters. All right, so we're getting M sub I R equals to the A sub I R's. When we take R between one and L, R between one and L, um, then we're looking at this second index. So that would be the column entries. So from here, R equals one, we're dealing with the first column. Remember, we took I from one to K, so we're getting the A entries from A or B. When we've got uh, R between one and L, that second index between one and L, then we're picking out first column, second column. You're picking out entries of A. When you hit L, we have ran out of entries there, and then we move over to the entries of the B, which is why we swap from A's to B's when we hit L plus one. So we have a sum from R equals L plus one to L plus M, um, hmm, B stuff, uh, B stuff times G stuff. Now we had to bump those indices back because in the constituent matrices, you always start numbering at one, 
and you should be used to this by now. So bulk of the trouble is um, getting the, the indices to range over the right values. I and mean, we had a hell of a time with that when uh, section 3.1 proofs. So we're, what we're gonna do is take uh, parameter R and subtract L from it. So the second sum in terms of that new parameter S can run from one to M. S runs from one to M. And then I can describe this in terms of entries of matrix B. And similarly, entries of matrix G over here and entries of matrix E over here. It's because of the way the indices partition up the thing. So we've taken the IJ entry, where does it say? The IJ entry of the matrix product, we're finding the IJ entry in this matrix product over here, where I is between one and K and J is between one and P. So we should be getting these entries here. And these are supposed to turn out to be uh, entries in AE plus entries in uh, BG, the products, which is exactly what they are. All right, so the IJ entry of MN is the sum of the IJ entry of A times E and the IJ entry of B times G. So let's observe that. We're summing over L here and S here. Uh, sorry, summing over R in the first one and S in the second one. We've got A sub I, R, E sub R, J. That's exactly, since I and J were given up here as something or other, that's exactly the IJ entry of the matrix product, matrix A times matrix E. This is exactly the IJ entry of matrix B times matrix G. So the IJ entry of MN for this range of I and J is IJ entry of AE plus IJ entry of BG. That is AE plus BG, IJ entry of. So we've got exactly what we wanted to get the IJ entry of the matrix product for this range of values E is IJ entry of A times E plus IJ entry of B times G, the IJ entry of this. Now, we could take the I's and the J's and change them. We could change the J's to range from um, P plus one to P plus N. If we did that, let's see, we're no longer looking at these first P columns, but then we're looking at the second bunch of columns. So we'd modify this, that'd give us a second bunch of columns. We could modify this, that'd give us a second bunch of rows, pick up at K plus one and go through uh, K plus N. This is the dimension we'd be interested in here. Anyhow, there's four cases of that to do. And if they're similar, they're probably a touch more tedious because now I've got to do some subtractions on the indices. I'm going to do some subtractions to get those indices to run from um, one to whatever appropriate upper value. So we'd need to do a subtraction in one case on one of those indices. In another case, we do need to do a subtraction on the different index. Here we're subtracting from the second index. Here we're subtracting from the first index. When we're down there in the lower right, we'll have to, have to subtract from both indices. And this must be that entry we had in the lower right. So let me leave that one a little um, loosey-goosey on the last part. It's the same type of argument, slightly more tedious because you've got to do more shifting of indices. We actually did the easy one where I didn't have to do any subtraction in those indices to recognize that we had the right thing. All right, back to the notes. What else we got here? Uh, okay, some row and column interchanging. Uh, you're well familiar with row in row operations, row interchange, row scaling, row addition. For a given matrix A, we can perform the following. We can row interchange, that is form a new matrix by interchanging row I and row J of a given matrix A. We'll denote that by A results from taking row I and row J of A and interchanging them to produce matrix B. Little tilde symbol here. Uh, this manipulation of taking a matrix and applying these row operations to it produce probably different matrices, but the relationship between the original matrix and the elementary row operation modified matrix is called row equivalence. It's an equivalence relation. 
and that's why the tildes are used. These are kind of giant tildes um, produced <coughs> produced in terms of latex uh, over over tilding uh, some symbols for, for your information. But row interchange is indicated like this. Uh, we can take a row, say row I, and multiply it by a non-zero scalar S. Uh, indicated R sub I goes to S times R sub I. Make that a little bit bigger. It's a little bit big except for these little small fonts here. Uh, and we can take row addition to row I, we can uh, add S times row J. Indicated like this, these are called row interchange, row scaling, row addition, usual elementary row operations that get so much attention in linear algebra. Something maybe that didn't get quite so much attention is elementary column operations. So these three things are called elementary row operations. We could similarly define column interchange, column scaling, and column addition, and introduce elementary column operations. Uh, we encountered a tiny bit of that. Uh, we encountered a moderate amount of it in the previous section. We actually went through these, um, these elementary row operations in the previous section and saw how they were affected by determinants. All right, uh, we'll see that uh, each elementary row operation can be performed on a matrix by multiplying it on the left row operations by an appropriate matrix. They're called elementary matrices because they form elementary, they perform elementary row operations. Uh, actually, elementary column operations can be performed uh, on a matrix by multiplying it on the right by an appropriate elementary matrix. So this might be new stuff to you, and you're used to using elementary matrices to perform row operations by multiplying on the left by an elementary matrix. Yeah, it turns out if you multiply on the right by an elementary matrix, you're performing column operations. Uh, Gentle throws around even more vocabulary of pre-multiplication and post-multiplication. I'll just use the terminology, multiply on the left and multiply on the right and leave that terminology out of our discussion. Uh, definition of an elementary matrix, we'll call them elementary matrices, here's just some other terms for those as well, is an n by n matrix which is formed by performing one elementary row operation or one elementary column operation on the n by n identity matrix. If the operation is row interchange or column interchange, the resulting matrix is called an elementary permutation matrix. And we're gonna use, we need some symbols. So we're introducing some symbols here. We're also introducing a new class of matrix. Uh, if the p, pth and qth rows or columns of I sub n have been interchanged, then the uh, elementary permutation matrix is denoted E sub PQ. So E for elementary, P and Q for this fact that we've interchanged the pth row and the qth row or column. It'll yield the same matrix. A product of elementary permutation matrix matrices is called a permutation matrix, which think what it does, let's say it's a permutation matrix with an eye towards row operations. So multiplication on the left by this elementary matrix, apparently, that's the next thing we'll prove. Uh, this permutation matrix takes the rows of matrix A and uh, swaps them two at a time. It's a permutation matrix, it permutes them. Each of these elementary permutation matrices swaps two rows. I ought to remind you of transpositions from symmetry groups. When you take a bunch of these transpositions, they produce, in general, some permutation. That's the reason these are called permutation matrices. The elementary per permutation matrices transpose two rows. You multiply a bunch of those together, it's a bunch of transpositions. That is, it's a permutation. Permutations can be written as products of transpositions. Uh, we uh, possibly stated, yeah, sure we stated that, because we classified permutations as even or odd, and we did that in terms of products of transpositions. Okay, next theorem claims that, uh, what we've already alluded to, that we can perform 
elementary row operations by multiplying on the left by elementary matrices. We can perform elementary column operations by multiplying on the right by elementary matrices. Specifically, each of the three elementary row operations on an M by N matrix A can be accomplished by multiplication on the left by an elementary matrix, which is formed by performing the same elementary row operation on the N by N identity matrix. So you wanna multiply the third row by five, do that to an N by N identity matrix, and then you can take that N by N identity matrix, multiply it on the left of A, and it'll multiply, what did I say, the, the third row of A by five. Whatever you did to the identity matrix to produce that elementary matrix, multiplication on the left will do that operation to matrix A. Similarly, notice it had to be N by N for the multiplication to be defined. Similarly, every column operation on this matrix can be accomplished by multiplication on the right, on the right for columns, by an elementary matrix, which is formed by performing the same elementary column operation on the identity matrix that you want to perform on A. Only difference between these two, columns down here, multiplication on the right down here rows up here, multiplication on the left up here. So let's look at a proof of that. 